Okay, it looks like the uh, entrance into the meeting have slowed to a bit of a trickle, so we'll get started here, and I trust others will join us along the way. Um, thank you again to everybody for uh, joining. Um, hopefully, you were able to participate also in the uh, Alpine meeting that um, took place uh, starting at 10 o'clock. Um, if you weren't able to join that, uh, the recording is now being uploaded and will be linked from the um, the page on the website um, where the information is about the family orientation. Um, so we covered um, a lot of territory there from our program structure to philosophy to training breakdown, um, as well as some um, sort of parent support uh, tips, as well as uh, uh, volunteerism and a number of other things that apply to everyone in the Alpine program. So I'm not uh, going to repeat any of those things as part of the meeting here, but uh, to deal with things that are of specific interest to uh, all of you as some of our age class families. Um, and those of you that dropped off kids this morning know that um, all of the coaches are busy with the kids doing dry land and having meetings and getting ready to go up on snow um, here in a little bit of time. So um, I'm uh, solely responsible for the meeting today um, and hopefully we'll have all of the information, but um, I just warn you ahead of time, there may be some specific questions I don't have the answer to and I'll need to refer to, uh, to Jared, to David or to others on the team. Um, so again, thank you for um, joining us here. And um, I wanna talk a little bit about our staffing and, and uh, specifically our philosophy in age class. And uh, as uh, I think everyone knows, uh, Jared Hedges is our head age class coach. And so he oversees the competition program for our U14, U12, yeah. and U10 age class. You team. have fun. Would you guys do? Right there. Thank you. Um, he oversees the entirety of the age class program for our U14, U12, and U10 uh, competition teams. Um, he has assisting him uh, David Housley who is our head U12, U10 coach. Um, and then Jared also serves the, uh, the role of head U14 coach within the H class team. So as uh, is consistent with the program structure that I described in the Alpine meeting, um, we have several of the, of the key staff who are uh, wearing multiple hats, if you will, uh, within the Alpine program. And, and, effort to be as um, efficient and economical as, uh, as possible. Then we also have on our full-time, uh, full-time seasonal staff for H class, uh, Colin Sushinsky. He's new to our uh, coaching team this year at the H class level. He spent the last two years coaching at Ski Race Devo. So some of you who are advancing from that Ski Race Devo program to H class uh, will know him from there. Um, and others of you will, uh, will be meeting him for the first time. He'll be working um, full-time all season long and supporting all of our training, both midweek and on the weekends, um, as will David and Jared. Then in addition, on the weekends, we have a number of part-time coaches who come in when our numbers swell with our part-time athletes on the weekend. Uh, returning are John Negamir, Fred Horvath, Sabrina uh, Loinig, uh, new to our staff this year, and again, maybe familiar to some of our Ski Race Devo staff are Brian Hume, um, Brian Hartman, uh, Kerry Corbin, who is returning um, as a part-time age class coach, and, uh, and then we sometimes supplement that also with uh, part-time coach Tina Buckheister, who works both in our um, ability program principally as a part-time coach, but um, has helped to fill in some gaps from time to time. So the structure of our program really is in part driven by our effort to be uh, as efficient as we can. Our typical midweek trainings for the H class kids uh, include somewhere on the order of about 20 athletes. And so we have the three full-time coaches who are there working with all of those kids. And then when our numbers swell to be um, more of our complete age class program on the weekends, then we bring in the part-time coaches to 
uh, to help with that. And each of the coaches then has a direction that they lean, if you will, um, you know, with an age group. Um, our age class team trains together um, almost 100% of the time midweek, meaning uh, those academy kids who are U10 are training with the academy kids on up through U14, and even sometimes integrating with our ability, our U16 and FIS kids uh, from time to time, either as a group or individuals. Um, and then on the weekends, we typically will break the group up in, into the different age groups. So the U10 team, uh, U12 team, and U14 team. Uh, our numbers in those programs are, give or take, about, um, about 30 each in our U14s and U12s, and um, just under 15 in our U10 team. Um, so we obviously rely on our part-time coaches extensively to help with that um, on the weekends and then also some um, some holiday periods. Um, we apply a, a team coaching approach, which means that um, we don't designate specific coaches to be the coach of specific athletes, but rather all of the coaches who are working within that subgroup, whether it's the academy kids midweek, plus any of the part-time kids who are able to attend, um, as well as then across those age groups, once we're into our weekend and holiday training and going to races, that all of the coaches that are working with that group are really working together and collaboratively to coach all of the kids. Um, we will have a, a designated communication method that we use that I'll go into a, a little bit further on here in the presentation to help uh, um, uh, to help explain that to everyone. Um, so our one of the things that that you know that we um, are making a, 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 a very diligent effort to do across all of our programs and those of you who um, uh, you know were, were obviously getting registered and so forth early in the year we closed our program enrollment already on the first of June uh, because we had hit our our sort of maximum ideal size in the program by that point. And I expect that that will continue to be the case moving forward. Um, and that is that I've, I've come to learn by making mistakes over the, over the uh, length of my career that uh, bigger is not always better. Um, and that we have to work hard to, to constrain our growth and be very, um, you know, be very diligent about staying true to that and true to those numbers. So, you know, we sat down several years ago as a staff before we were at, um, the numbers that we have today and uh, said, okay, in the ideal world, you know, in terms of the resources we have and in, in training space and the numbers of coaches that we have, the numbers of full-time coaches that we have, our ability to hire competent part-time coaches, you know, to be able to have both a, a, a group that is large enough to, you know, to be dynamic and, and not, uh, you know, not, you uh, uh, get clicky with uh, you know with the kids and and exclude anybody, but to also be small enough to be able to maintain that that real team feel and what we can manage in terms of our of our resources. What are those numbers? And uh, those numbers are are essentially you know where we've where we've gotten to today. Um, and so we we don't we we don't have an effort to grow. Um, we we are trying to be diligent about about not. Um, you know, not our, allowing ourselves to grow. Um, and at the same time, we want to serve the needs of those kids and families who've been part of our programs and make certain that anyone who has committed their time and energy to the program, um, you know, whether it's for one year or for three or four or five years, having moved up from ITS to Ski Race Devo and into the H class program, that we always have a place for them. Um, one of the things that we do not intend to do is to, is to begin making cuts based on ability. And, um, and we feel that that's very important for us as, as uh, in terms of being a ski club is to be able to address the interest and ability levels of, of a broad variety of, of uh, different outcomes that people are interested in and uh, different ability levels, different commitment levels and so forth. That's what we strongly feel is is uh, the sign of a, a of a strong and and inclusive ski club, is to not become elitist in that regard. Um, so we always will have a place for returning athletes, and if that makes our numbers exceed our targets, then so be it. 
but we will always be highly selective of, of those um, athletes who are new to the program that want to join our program from, you know, from outside of our community, uh, you know, our existing Team Summit community, as well as our local community, that, uh, that we don't just, um, you know, that we just don't open the floodgates and therefore stress our programs. And that's been a very difficult lesson that I've learned on multiple occasions now personally, that uh, as the Alpine director, um, I'm determined not to not to allow ourselves to make that mistake again in the future. Um, so I, I've mentioned a little bit, you know, our part-time and full-time programs, and I want to really um, spend a little bit of time in defining how that works and just so everybody really does understand. Um, this is our second year now of, of having uh, the part-time program evolve in the way that it has evolved now. Um, and so maybe it'll be a little bit useful to help give some history and some background so everyone understands that. But when, when I began to work with Team Summit, um, now going just over three years ago, um, you know, the part-time program was really designed to begin the day that uh, the local resorts open to the public or specifically a Copper Mountain open. So sometime around the second or third week of November, just before Thanksgiving and continue on until um, the last races of the year, typically the Loveland Derby or, or some season ending spring series fish races. Um, and that it was designated that it was a program that allowed, um, allowed the skiers to ski either of our night training sessions, which at that point we we're offering Wednesday and Friday evenings. Now, unfortunately, because of, of Keystone's night operation schedule, that's only on Friday evenings. And then also for Friday afternoons, and then of course the weekends and school holidays. Um, so that, that was, was quite specific and quite restrictive. Um, it also meant that during the early season training period um, from the beginning of, uh, you know, beginning of that early season training at third week of October, typically at Copper, until the area opened to the public, that any of those days that, uh, that part-time skiers wish to ski were then billed individually as add-on days, as bonus days or drop-in days. Um, so what, what I did and first with the ability program and then uh, two years ago, and then we introduced in the age class program last year was that you know, I counted up the number of days that that program was available for, meaning you know, the 20 weeks between you know, the third week of, of November until the second week of April, uh, 20 weeks times three days equals 60 days of total contact. And of course, as we reviewed our attendance records, very few of the athletes attended um, all of those days because there are, ob there are obvious conflicts. There's some weekends that maybe they weren't, um, you know, weren't uh, able to ski or what have you. And we just said, look, let's, let's make the part-time program much more flexible. Let's allow athletes to come any day that works for them. Let's also allow them to come in the early season period if that works for them. And, you know, and then let's cap it at that same 60 days. And so provide more flexibility, more value, and at the same time, you know, maintain the opportunity at that number of days. Um, and so, you know, that, you know, as we entered into that, there were lots of questions about, you know, could we manage that properly? You know, would we be overwhelmed, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And we've had some learnings along the way. But of course, it's very helpful for us now in our planning process to have those team snap calendars. And, and so we can see, you know, the numbers of people that we're going to have. And if we recognize that, you know, because of, you know, a certain day being a particularly popular with more of our membership to come up and participate in that training, or there's a school holiday or other factors, then we can anticipate that and make sure that we've got the appropriate training venue scheduled and then we have the appropriate number of, of coaches on board. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, you know, integrating. So essentially what we've done is we've integrated our part-time program into the full-time program on a part-time basis. And what I mean by that is, that oftentimes if, if a part-time program such as the one we had before was designated for a specific day of the week, starting at a specific time, only running till a, a specific time, um, then the program might be built around 
that uh, to a greater degree than it is presently. Meaning, you know, those first weekends when kids were on snow and the, you know, in the uh, third week of November would be, you know, more fundamentals focused and and have specific, you know, progressions for those part time kids. The disadvantage of the additional flexibility that I just described is that sometimes kids will come in and it'll be their first day of, of training on snow, particularly this time of year. Other kids who are there may have already, you know, some of our kids are on 15, 16. Uh, I think today is the 17th day on snow for some of the kids. Um, and so they're in a completely different place in terms of their progression. And we've built the, the full-time program, which those part-time athletes are participating in on a part-time basis around the needs of those um, of those full-time athletes who are there each day. Now, to the extent that we can, we always will pull out those kids that we know are, you know, are earlier in this stage of getting on their skis for the year or might be, you know, just getting on their new equipment or, you know, uh, just be moving into the program. And we will, whenever we possibly can, you know, uh, assign them with a group or a coach that day that will help them and, and be able to, to, you know, somewhat fill whatever gaps might be there in their, um, you know, in their, um, uh, as a result of their individual schedules. Um, but either way is imperfect. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to think that this way is, is closer to ideal than the alternative of having just, you know, very uh, regimented times that athletes can train and participate and then have coaches dedicated to those kids. Um, because then we segregate the part-time kids from the full-time kids. They have to have a different coaching staff. They have to be on a different progression. They have to have, you know, different, uh, you know, training venues perhaps that they're on and, and different schedules. So, you know, the advantage is that, that uh, you know, we integrate those kids and let all of them benefit from, you know, being part of the same team with, with any of the academy or full-time athletes when they are able to come and have the, the opportunity to interact with the same group of coaches. The downside is, is that the progression may not always be perfect for that athlete who's, you know, coming for their first day, um, you know, when others in the group have had multiple days on snow, either that week in the weekly progression, or, you know, at the beginning of the season, as we are now into our season long progression. So hopefully that help, helps to explain um, sort of the, the hows and whys of the part-time and full-time programs and give you that little bit of background and how we, uh, how we got there. And if that's created more questions than answers, you know, then feel free as we get sort of to the end of, of this and you have those questions and please do raise them with me. Um, the other thing that I, that I wanna um, spend a little bit of time explaining um, because particularly in the last couple of days, we've had some disruptions with that. We probably will again over the course of the next couple of days or weeks. And that is with the whole fall training program and how that is, um, you know, how that is managed. Um, as you can probably gather from most of the experience that you've had, you know, with me personally in terms of, of you know, scheduling and so forth, um, you know, I try to be as far out as I can and, as can, you know, consistent and organized with scheduling and so forth, um, because I recognize and we recognize as staff how important that is to all of you as families, how much goes into planning, you know, not the, just the activities of your team summit ski racers, but also the other kids in your family, your own personal lives, you know, how you schedule your weekends, how you drive up. One parent maybe has to stay down in Denver for those of you that are coming up from the front range because of activities other siblings have or, you know, all of those things. We, we realize that's very dynamic and difficult to, you know, to manage. So we want to try to be as consistent as we can. So when we have things happen, as we did um, yesterday with the age class training in that you know, we found out at five o'clock in the evening from Copper Mountain that there wasn't space for our age class team to train. Um, you know, then that puts us into a situation which we realize is really disruptive to each of you as families. And that, frankly, we as staff hate to, to put you in and hate to have to try to manage as well. Um, the reason that this kind of thing happened, particularly in this case, is, um, you know, the fall training um, program for Copper Mountain is an important and significant source of revenue uh, for their company. It is that revenue that funded uh, or that anticipated revenue that um, 
uh, help to rationalize the funding of the improvements that were made to ordeal in terms of adding snowmaking, in terms of making that a permanent training venue for Team Summit over the course of the winter, um, you know, in terms of uh, all of the efforts that they make in, term, in supporting the club and providing for our training and so forth, was in part, you know, significantly offset by their expectation that they would be able to generate revenue, you know, on that venue specifically, but throughout all of their fall training. As I think everybody's familiar, there's there are literally, without exaggeration, over a hundred different teams from around the country and around the world at all different levels. You know, some commercial camps as well as you know clubs, academies, colleges, national teams from all around the world that come here to Copper um, to train in this. You know, what is really the best training, the best alpine ski race training environment. Uh, in all of North America during this time of year, and one of the best anywhere in the world, um, and and pay significant uh, monies to Copper to do so, stay in the lodging, buy their meals, et cetera, et cetera. So when we have a situation as we did uh, just yesterday, that the tech venue, which um, you know was had been slated to be open. The speed venue, which had been slated to be completed, it was finally completed last night, and together with the help of myself and some of our other staff in terms of putting up the, the safety netting and so forth, and they're training now uh, downhill all the way to the bottom for the first day this fall. Uh, but that's about a week later than was originally projected. And likewise, the tech venue had been projected to be open about a week ago, and is still probably you know a day or two away from um, from getting opened. And as a result, the teams that have been booked in, you know, many coming from, you know, great distances and spending, you know, great deals of money to be here, um, you know, are trying to, you know, be squeezed into what's, you know, uh, less than about half of the space that was expected to be available. So when that puts a lot of pressure on the demands, then in part because of all the wonderful opportunities that are provided to us over the course of the whole fall, then you know, we're asked to cut back our, uh, our needs and our usage. And because there isn't an environment on copper where we can go free ski or we can go do drills, just not have a training lane, then that means that we're, you know, we're shut out. Um, and that, that happens infrequently enough that even yeah. though it is a huge um, inconvenience to everyone involved on the whole scheme of, of what that means for us, what's provided to us over the course of the fall, you know, it's a it's a small, um, you know, really a small price to pay for, you know, what's an incredible opportunity. Um, and that is one of the, the really wonderful opportunities that we have at Team Summit when, when our season starts almost without fail, um, you know, in the third week of October, October 22nd this year. Um, and then continues on with some some breaks, but through our May and June camps all the way until the middle of June, um, you know, we have a, a season where we can train at home that is, uh, you know, really the envy of, of uh, certainly of the rest of North America. And, uh, and, you know, from conversations I have with my colleagues from around the world, you know, the envy of the of the world for our club to have that kind of training, that kind of quality to have you know essentially the whole world come to us in the fall is really something that is is special and and we should never uh, never take for granted. Um, you know I I often use the analogy of you know if you're a, a junior high basketball player you know are you ever going to be on the on the same court um, you know and having a shoot around or or playing pickup game with Nikola Jokic. Um, you know, it's not likely to happen, but, you know, Michaela Schifrin, who is the greatest of all time, is oftentimes training on the lane that's right next to us and, and uh, you know, maybe loading the chair, you know, even with, with some of our kids or in front or behind our kids. And, uh, and that is an, uh, an a, some almost unsurpassed opportunity, not just in ski racing, but across all of sports, to have that connection from, you know, being uh, at the very first stages to, um, you know, all the way to the, the very top of our sport. So hopefully that helps to explain uh, a little bit the fall training. Um, it is and will continue to be fluid in that regard. So as much as we would like to, you know, to be um, precise and perfect with our, 
with our training plans and we try to anticipate what it is and we look into the future as we can with with copper personnel specifically about where it looks like we'll be able to have our training and you know obviously we're limited in our midweek days by the fact that the kids are in school um, weekend days were more open we try never to schedule the youngest kids in that 6 30 in the morning session because we know that's challenging both for the kids to you know to get going that time of day but also for those families who might be driving long distances the morning of uh to get there and to uh, you know not have to come up a day early um you know so we try to anticipate that but then again there's there's just uh those inevitable changes, which cause us to, um, you know, quite frankly, appear like we're disorganized. Um, but in any case, uh, hopefully, and, and certainly appreciate everybody's understanding and flexibility when it comes to that. And hopefully that helps also to shed a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of light on, on uh, you know, what, what the factors are that drive that. Um, as we go into our competition planning for the season, um, you know, the competition calendars are updated, posted on TeamSnap and accurate to the best of our knowledge. The official calendar came out from Rocky Mountain Division just uh, earlier this week or late last week. So the delays that we've had or changes that we've had to make recently that calendar are really driven by, you know, the factors of, of Rocky Mountain Division scheduling the races, making the assignments for which teams are going to which of the age class opens and so forth. But all of that information now is in the Team Snap calendar, as well as available on the on the Rocky Mountain Division website, which I frequently um, share links to. But if you just Google our uh, RMD US Ski and Snowboard, you will come right there. It'll be the first hit on on Google, and uh, on that page, the calendars are there. They're updated. The race fact sheets or race announcements will be posted once they're available. Um, there are lists for selections for you know, different teams and championships and all of those kinds of things when they're available. So, you know, basically if it's not there, then um, the coaches don't have the information either uh, because that's where we're getting the information. Um, you know, we're not, we're not fed that information in, in secret ahead of time. Um, so if it, if it can't be found there, then um, the coaches, the coaches also don't have it. Um, so again, your, your patience there, sometimes that, that information is not as timely as all of us would like it to be, um, but we try to stay ahead of that and behind the scenes we're, we're constantly pressing on, on whether it's uh, RMD itself or, or whether it's the hosting events, um, you know, to get that information up and post it and, and be there available in timely fashion. Um, the race calendar returns to more or less normal this year with uh, regards to having less restrictions um, that were implemented last year in terms of the COVID protocols. Um, there are less field size restrictions. Um, there are uh, the opportunity to return for the U14s to have all the U14s together in several of the, um, of the events leading up to the championship. Um, yeah, meaning that the first age class event of the year, the age class open is the only time outside of our season ending events, such as the Loveland Derby and GS Spectacular, where all of the U14, excuse me, U12 and U10 will be competing together. Um, then after that, the U14s from across RMD will be competing together in those U14 events, which also serve as qualifiers then for both the RMD championship, as well as the Rocky Central U14 championship that are um, taking place later in the year. Um, there are also then opportunities for U14s to experience some pointed competition uh, or scored competition for USSA points um, later in the year through some of the SYNC events. And uh, if you check that SYNC calendar that's posted on the RMD site, you will see in the notes section which ones are open to U14s. And uh, so we will be planning to attend those with some or all um, of the U14s. In some cases, there is a qualification process. In some cases, they are completely open. Um, so again, that's one of those that's a little bit more fluid, a little bit more difficult to plan with. Um, one can make some assumptions which of those the U14s uh, might be attending. Um, but there are still some, some of those um, questions that remain unanswered at, until we get into the competition season and kids have established their performance level for the year and those opportunities present themselves. Um, then, as I mentioned, the season uh, wraps up with those 
um, opportunities, both uh, scored and non-scored in the Loveland Derby and GS Spectacular. And again, the difference between scored and non-scored events is just whether they're scored to the US, uh, US Ski and Snowboard seeding points list, um, which becomes uh, far more important at the U16 age, um, but it allows the U14s to begin to develop those um, seeding point profiles before they, uh, before they move into the U16 age group and also to experience the level of competition at that, uh, at that next step. Um, as I mentioned in, in our full Alpine meeting, but I think is worth mentioning again, um, we are hosting a number of events this year. Um, it is our goal to host events here at home where we can both save money from travel expense and hotel rooms and, and uh, meals and so forth, which I know some of you as families have begun to make your plans for uh, a couple of the away events and, and uh, you know, the cost for those things, um, they're sobering. So we wanna to try to minimize those as much as we can. Um, and the way that we do that is by hosting some events here at home. Um, the, the cost to us of those events is that we have to all roll up our sleeves and throw in and pitch in to help with that. And uh, I just wanna say, I'm really appreciative of the, uh, the handful of parents, some who are on this call who've um, taken up the challenge of getting their official certification. Uh, we have a referee clinic that's taking place from 3 to 9 p.m. Uh, tonight. That's a first step into certified, um, you know, into becoming a certified official, or the second step actually up after the CO uh, course, the certified official course, which is done online. Um, but it's really important. We need those certified officials when we're hosting events to fill some of the key um, race organization uh, roles, um, any of the jury positions, including start and finish referee. Um, our chief of course, chief of race, um, the chief of race is an internal position. Chief of course typically is a position filled by the, uh, by the host resort in most cases. Um, and then in particular, the, the uh, you know, kind of the biggest job in, in race administering uh, or race administration, which is the race administrator, which is a, a several years process to, you know, to get to, to um, you know, to be able to, to fill that important role. Um, you know, those are key for us to be able to have those um, educated and skilled volunteers, if you will, along with, you know, plenty of opportunities for um, people to receive their work deposit credits by working in any of the, uh, of the unskilled positions, the easier roles to fill that don't require that certification, but are equally as important, um, you know, to our running the race so that we can run a quality event. Um, which is critical for us to be able to continue to host events in the future. If we don't do a, a really great job and, and really have pride as an organization and uh, in running high quality events, both for our kids and for visiting teams, then when it comes to, you know, bidding on those events, we'll be looked on uh, less favorably than some others. So um, again, I apologize to those that were on the earlier call for making that pitch an additional time, but it is just so important to us in so many ways. Um, and that information is, is now available by logging into CampMinder, going into the volunteer section. Um, each of those events uh, are posted there along with the volunteers who are needed. And uh, you can begin to, to sign up for those. And that's a wonderful way to support the club, to support your kids, to be involved in an event, um, and uh, you know, to be able to be there um, um, you know, participating in, in uh, your kids' endeavors. Um, so finally, one thing I spent quite a bit of time on the Alpine call on again, but I, it's important enough. And, uh, you know, I think by now everybody knows I blow this horn, but the importance of equipment preparation and making certain that, that uh, particularly at the age class level, where the expectation is that the, the kids are, are too young and, and not uh, don't have enough dexterity to be able to really do a good job in preparing their own equipment that um, that all of the parents on the call that that um, that you help with that that you help make sure that their equipment is prepared properly um, whether it's done professionally or done you know done by yourselves um, you know it is it is both the single biggest differentiator um, for the kids and their success in the sport and in, in the program and in training and in races. And in terms of having an enjoyable experience to actually have skis that do 
what uh, you know what they're supposed to when when the kids are doing the things that we ask them to, um, you know, to learn those really critical skills that are going to be um, um, help them be successful carving and carving on hard snow. Um, that uh, I, I cannot uh, overemphasize the importance of that of those kids coming to every day of training and having skis that are properly sharpened and prepared for uh, the kinds of conditions that we experience. So again, that's a place where coaches are available to help, to help provide that education. Uh, there's been a lot of information and, and uh, links to a great uh, online series of, of instructional videos, um, you know, of what to do and what, uh, you know, what uh, the important things are. Um, but it really, really is, uh, it is really critically important. So uh, apologies to those that heard my sermon previously and had to hear it again, but it is, as you can hopefully tell, such, a, such an important uh, thing on the, uh, for the experience of the kids in the program. So I've been a very broad way, covered all of the things that I wanted to. I'm sure that there are uh, questions, whether now or later, feel free to reach out to me. Um, afterwards or reach out to your head coaches, whether that's uh, Jared uh, U14 or David U1210 or uh, those things that have to do with the entire Alpine program and, and not necessarily age class specific myself or those things that are age class specific, but not necessarily with the, the head coaches of the respective age groups than uh, with Jared. And uh, we can help both offline uh, or if there are questions that those of you that are on the call I have right now, I'm happy to address those as well. So please feel free to unmute and jump in with your, with your questions um, if you have them. Um, one thing I forgot to bring up actually about our, our competition planning and so forth is once we do have those race announcements, we will also publish information, um, you know, with regards to that, to all of the age class families. And, uh, and because in age class, the travel schedule is predictable, um, meaning that there are a few optional events that some of the athletes might attend as, as the U14s advancing into some sync races and and so forth. Um, when they do go to those sync races, when they travel with the ability staff, um, if it's not done as a full team, but if there's several athletes that qualify into a specific sync, then they will be subject to the ability travel policy versus the age class travel policy. And the age class travel policy is since the uh, coaches are traveling independently of uh, the kids, that it's all family travel and the travel is predictable. We know how many age class opens there are gonna be. We know that there's gonna be an RMD championship and an Iraqi Central U14 championship. We know there's a Loveland Derby. We know there's a, a GS Spectacular that we can accurately predict what those expenses will be over the course of the season. And we build those uh, coaches expenses into the program fee, into the program expense. So there is for the, the basic age class travel schedule, there is no uh, there are no fees charged for the coach travel. There are, of course, the fees that are paid to the organizer, um, you know, such as the lift tickets and the entry fees, but we don't bill back any of the travel expenses. In the ability program, because the race schedules are highly variable, dependent on the level of the athlete, which disciplines they compete in, whether they do do downhill or super G, or they just focus on slalom and giant slalom, whether they're advancing to national level events or even international events, you know, if they're racing in Devo or the elite series or both, you know, the travel schedules become far, far more variable than they are at the age class level. So what we do at the ability level is that we take all of those coaches expenses and any team expenses, if and when we offer team travel. Um, and those are divided up amongst all of the participants in that competition. So those expenses for most of the sync races are fairly minimal because um, I think all of the sync races except the Aspen downhill week are all local day trip 
uh, races. There may be one that's not, I'm, I'm going by memory here, but basically the only expenses then are coaches per diems, uh, you know, perhaps uh, parking expenses, other expenses like that. And then all of those are added up after the event and then divided amongst all of the, all of the participants. So each participant will have a share of that expense to pay. It will be added to the, uh, to the camp minder, to each individual's account. Um, and there will be a published accounting for that. So everybody can look at that and, and see what those expenses were, how they were divided and so forth. And so I work with a, a, a spreadsheet template that I've created takes into account if we have a three-day event, but an athlete only participates in one day or another participates in three days, then it changes their, you know, their share of those shared expenses and, and so on and so forth. And we're trying um, as much as we can as a team and as a staff to keep those expenses as low as possible. But that is, I know that was a surprise both to some families that uh, advanced to ability class as well as uh, families of athletes who had those opportunities from U14 to advance into some ability class races. Um, and I just wanted to explain that up front so there was no surprise. And, and uh, at the ability meeting, I'll spend some time explaining that also. Uh, I know that that was a shortfall in my own communication previously with regards to, uh, to how that took place. Uh, so again, we're getting kind of. Uh, Aldo, to the I have uh, one question, if I could. Sure. Um, uh, I have a U twelve, and so it looks like um, what has been retained out of last year is the racing four races, you know, on one day by gender for a few of the races at least. And so the question I had is, will there be a training day for the other gender? Uh, you know, on the. If, if let's say men are racing Sunday, do they train on Saturday um, or is that an off day? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if, um, if it's a trip that can be day tripped or um, the genders will be actually on different schedules, then we will offer training um, still here in Summit County for the gender that's not racing or for any athletes who might choose not to race would be attending training. So there will always be home training going on during those events. Um, at most of the resorts, so for example, and I can't remember which one is set up that way because there are some variations in that, but typically there won't be a training opportunity at the resort itself. The, the coaches may organize, however, that day is a free skiing day or what have you, but typically we'll have enough coaches there uh, or make it available to the families is what I'm saying, but not organize it as yeah. a scheduled training day. So typically we'll have enough coaches on site to handle the race venue itself. And because the hosting area is running a race, they do usually don't have an additional venue available for training. I guess I'm thinking like Crested Butte specifically, right? So um, for those of us making travel arrangements, are we trying to make a hotel for Friday and Saturday if you're... Uh, say men, you know, or so there will be some kind of free ski you're thinking on Saturday, if you're racing on Sunday, or there would be just... that, there would, yeah, there would at least be that opportunity. And that's a great question to, uh, uh, for me to share with Jared and make sure that he communicates about that. Since we don't know all of the details yet about that, and we're obviously a long ways away from the fact sheet being ready for us. Sure. Um, you know, we, we don't, know necessarily what the answer to that question is going to be right now. But I think what you can expect in terms of planning is that at least there'll be a, the opportunity for the kids to free ski on that on that opposite gender day, uh, be able to purchase a reduced price ticket, or if it's an icon resort or an epic resort or whatever, use their pass. But likely there will not be any scheduled training or group free skiing on that day. Um, but with the caveat that if the resort makes a training slope available, that that could be uh, offered, um, but we just don't know, you know, from the sure. whole if that will be. But I'll make sure to raise that question with Jared also, so he can communicate about that. And there may be some advanced work that he can do to find out with the resort what their opportunity might be for training on those days. Great, thank you. Although, as far as um, planning then for hotels on any away events, we're that we're all on our own on that? Or do you suggest anything or have group rates or any of that help 
help in planning? No, we don't have any uh, any group rates or blocks of rooms reserved, um, you know, those kinds of things. So all the families are on their own to make those uh, arrangements as well as make their decisions about, you know, is it something that they're going to, you know, if it's in Steamboat, for example, like it is for the skills quest, you know, is it something they would day trip in the morning or would they go up the night before? Um, and, uh, you know, so that that is um, completely up to the individual family to decide those things. Once, um, and the coaches are in the process of making um, their arrangements um, right now, and once they do have those made, then they will communicate that, okay, the coaching staff is staying at this hotel or that hotel or is renting a condo here or what have you, so that um, uh, others, will, others will know where the coaches are lodging. Okay, both great questions. Thanks for that. Um, any other questions? Um, happy to stay on if there's more uh, questions from anybody. Otherwise, um, again, thank you very much all for participating. Hopefully there's been some useful information there. Don't hesitate to reach out to myself um, for any of those uh, broader questions, um, specific age class questions. Again, please refer them either to Jared or to uh, David for U12, U10, and, uh, you know, likewise, uh, feel free to reach out to me at any time about anything. Okay, so it looks like I'm not cutting anybody off from their questions. Um, again, thanks very much. I know I'll see some of you in uh, about 11 minutes on the ability call as well. Um, and again, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks, Alda.